Welcome to Oil Painting Question and Answers, episode number nine. Uh, before we get into the questions, I'm going to do a little painting demonstration that I'm going to paint with the uh, five colors in the Geneva Essential Palette to address some of the misconceptions about working wet and wet or uh, a la prima. And one of those misconceptions is that the brushwork is lost if you're working wet and wet or that the paint gets all blended together and, and people want to see the brushwork. So without further ado, let's get into the demonstration. So I'm going to paint this little pair um, that I'm going to use to demonstrate uh, some things about brushwork and working wet and wet. And, um, but before I do that, let me explain to you two sort of uh, views about brushwork. Uh, on the one hand, there are artists who intentionally, um, they will paint whatever it is they're painting and they're intentionally, proactively putting brushwork into whatever it is they're painting. Um, and artists like that, a lot of them will use even square brushes so that when they go and, and paint the edge of an apple, you can see a square as the brush starts and it's kind of slightly more blocky. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing it that way. It's a, complete, it's a style of painting. Um, and, but let me just tell you my own perspective and I think, at least I've always felt like this is where the way Sargent uh, thought about brushwork and also some other great artists. But what I do is I don't, I try not to think about brushwork at all. And, and what I'll do instead is think about execution and what I'm trying to do. You're thinking, I need to put that shadow right there. So you put the shadow there and you see a glow, and so you put the glow there. And you're, you're painting uh, with a strong stroke because you're just, you know, knocking it out, wet and wet. You're painting a still life in, in you know, 20 minutes or whatever it is. Um, and as part of that, and I think that that's how Sargent painted. That's how he could sit out in, in a, you know, field and dash something off in a hurry or even, even a portrait. He was very much about putting, getting the right color in his brush and then putting it where it goes. But I don't think he was actively sort of trying to create this brushwork. Um, in other words, what you're looking at is your, is your, is your source. You know, you're trying to paint what you see. And in the process of trying to paint what you see, there's brushwork because you haven't gone in and, you know, polished it up to, to look like a photograph. And so that's kind of my perspective. So I'm going to uh, paint this pair. And when I paint this uh, pair, I'm going to try to be confident with my brush stroke. I'm going to think about my colors. Um, I, in fact, I've already, as you can see, I've already mixed up this palette of color here. This is not um, the method that I teach. And, and I want to make this point very strong because I don't, I think that if you're learning um, my method or you're, or you're learning to paint in oil for the first time, this is not how you would mix a palette of color. You would not want to mix these smears. You would want to go and follow the online course. It's free, drawmixpaint.com. You can find it right there and do, the, do it that way. This is really how I paint. And so I don't do that much pre-mixing. You know, I mixed every one of these colors in about 10 or 15 minutes. I'm going to mix a lot more colors as I go. I'm going to play with color. I didn't even get into some of the browns up in the stem. Um, but that's how I, I would normally paint a still life. But I don't recommend that you paint that way if you're starting out. So let me get into this and, and see, uh, see how it goes. So I might check a few colors, and if I want to see what this shadow's doing, I can just do a quick check like that. But I don't um, normally check colors very much when I'm uh, painting. When I'm doing demonstrations for students, um, you know, I might check my colors more to sort of explain how. But when I'm painting myself, I really don't do very much color checking. I just sort of trust my instinct on it, and it's an instinct that anybody can develop over time. But before I even get started, I'm going to put in some, uh, some lines here. And I actually want to be a little bit more 
and just kind of give myself something to look at. And maybe just a couple of marks for the top, just so I can, in fact, you know what I may do is I could just take some background color, which I haven't mixed exactly. Just kind of draw this pair in. And I'm not trying to paint this pair exactly as I see it. Um, I'm just using it really, I mean, I, in other words, I don't really care if my pair looks exactly like that pair. Um, I really just am dashing it down as I would if I were painting a still life on my own. And again, I don't recommend that if you're starting out that you do your drawing as quickly as this. Um, it's much better if you're checking yourself using a proportion divider and learning how to draw before you get into this level of uh, just going for it, so to speak. And I always try to work um, my values and paint from dark to light. So that's why I'm going to go up here and put a little bit of this uh, dark stem color just so I can have it to look at. Because if you build your values right, you have more to look at. And, it, and you're able to sort of see it sooner instead of just looking at a bunch of brushed paint all over the place. And if you're not ex an experienced artist and uh, you haven't, or if you haven't done any color checking or used my method before, a lot of these colors I'm uh, laying in may look wrong to you at this stage, and you might think they're too dark or whatever it is. But that's once you do enough color checking, and I mean just two or three paintings, you will find that. Um, you can see through all those optical illusions and these colors that I'm putting in right now are actually uh, just right in their value and so it may look like they're too dark but they're actually just about right. So you'll notice as I paint this pair that I'm really not thinking about brushwork at all. I'm really just going about my business and putting the values where I see them without any thought about trying to create anything special in my brushwork. I'm just, you know, laying in my values very boldly. I'm thinking very much about the values. I'm thinking about um, in, in an extreme way I'm thinking about is this too light or is this too dark that's my number one concern and then as far as the color goes I just shift it and alter it and play with it on my palette and then just go and lay it in and don't think too much about brushwork or trying to be you know leave more brushwork or less, I'm just executing. I'm just filling in these empty spaces with the values that I think belong there. And again, a lot of this that I'm doing here is just from a years of experience of understanding, being able to see color and value without doing as much checking as you, as you would do if you're starting out and learning to paint, or especially if you're just or I should say even if you're just learning my method for the first time, I, I recommend that you do a lot more checking than what I'm doing here. But as far as the brushwork goes, um, you know, I have a certain brushwork that I just don't ask me where it comes from, but sort of the way that I paint. 
I try, try to maintain a lot of abstraction in what I do, and, and that's the only sort of thought, and, and that's only because I've learned that that's the way the natural world is. But again, the reason I'm maintaining abstraction and what I'm thinking about while I'm painting is not brushwork, but maintaining ab the abstraction, and, and that's because it's important. You see that in, in nature, you see that in life, you see that in this natural pair. Uh, that I'm trying to paint. Um, but if you look at it, um, you can see, and this goes back to ugly painting or painting ugly, if you look at the pair at this point and compare it and, and look at the colors that I'm mixing, um, it's really, you know, if you get in close and look at it, there's there's not and this is really even more true if you're the one who painted it, but it looks ugly. And it's only at a room's length does this begin to work at all. Um, and the other thing that's always important is to get some background in. And so by painting this table in um, and getting the colors you know, laid in around the, the base of the pair, that's going to help me to see the colors right in the pair. One of the things about wet on wet is that you can uh, put brush strokes on top of wet paint. It's not like you can't paint on top of paint. Some people think that if you're painting wet on wet, you can't paint in layers. But in a sense, if I want to put a line in here, I just draw it right into it. And if I want to make it even a harder line, I can do anything. Just paint right on top. Of course, you're going to get some mixture the longer you paint into other paint. But one of the nice things about wet on wet is you can do things like, you know, blend it into each other and create new colors. So let me go back to maintaining the abstraction. And, you know, even if you're painting a, a plastic chair, which is not natural, you still will find abstraction in the way the light reflects. It's just everywhere. And uh, what maintaining the abstraction means is that I'm not painting dot, 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 or a line, or, you know, our eyes are always oversimplifying everything we see. So this reflection down here in the bottom of the pair, or the way this uh, the table edge hits, if you'll notice, I'm always leaving it messy. And, I'm, and it's something that I've developed a habit for, but as I fill in a background or, um, you know, every stroke of the brush, there's a little bit of noise in what I do. I stop short, I twist, I turn, I scrub. Uh, I make a little bit of a mess in everything and I don't clean it up. Another nice thing about wet on wet, and this is a huge thing, is you can change the color. I started to put some blue in here and if I don't like it I can just mix in another color and blend it right into it and create a new color as opposed to when you're working wet on dry you really can't bring up any of your underpainting. And it's real easy to adjust a color if you need to. If I want to put some a little bit more red in my background, I just blend it into what I've got and I can change it easily and it all stays unified and works together. So as you can see, there's uh, plenty of brushwork in this wet and wet paint and it's really just a matter of how much further I want to take it. Um, and with wet and wet, it's not as if once you paint something, you can't paint further. You can change things. If I decide the shadow across the center here is a little bit too light, which I think it is, I can just go in there and change it.
So this pair is basically, um, I mean, I could leave it like this if I was, uh, wanted to leave it this rough. And, um, and I probably, I'm not, I certainly don't want to make it uh, all polished or anything. But what I may want to do, and this is another thing that's a misconception about wet and wet, is that I might want to make changes. If I decide, for instance, you know, I didn't really worry at all about the shape of this. I'm not trying to paint this perfect pair. I'm just knocking out a pair and not thinking. But what I may want to do is change the shape because for whatever reason, and so let me just show you how simple it is to push lines around. I'm going to go ahead and finish this little bit of background here. But let's say that I want to push up the top of that pair um, up here. You can just move your line, just as simple as that. I've got that stem cutting across, but you know what? I'm just going to repaint the stem. So wet and wet, you can certainly make changes, and in a lot of ways it's easier to make changes because you have all that color to blend into and you get real nice transitions. Um, but let me just make a few obvious changes that I see where I missed a few things. So if I want to take that spot out, I can just paint over it. Now, do I want to fix the shape of this pair? I could bulge this bottom out a little bit, put some of that nice reflection color. So I'm going to push this line a little bit that way. Bring this shadow over a little bit. So I can do all of this while I maintain a strong brush stroke. Maybe put a little bit of noise in there. There's a few spots that I see. It's always good to have a little bit of noise and not to over, you know, to mimic some of this texture that I see. You know, one of the things about a lot of great a la prima artists like John Singer Sargent, who painted, um, I think, primarily wet and wet when he was painting, um, and, and this goes for a lot of the great a la prima um, realists, uh, and, uh, and is that when they painted paintings, they would often pull them off the walls and make changes or decide that the composition should be different or they didn't like a shadow or they wanted to change a color and so the painting would be dry maybe not finished but just dry and and you know forgotten about for uh, you know a few weeks and then pulled off the wall and and adjustments are made or changes are made and so you invariably end up painting wet on dry and that happened to me quite often when I was painting uh, portraits where I would have to make a change or I decided I didn't like something and it had already dried and I would just go in and, and paint on top of it. And so I, I did quite a bit of wet on dry painting. But in general, it's uh, as far as the main execution, it's all about wet in wet. So that's it for today's lesson, and now let's get into some questions. I would like to approach a gallery owner about a show and wonder how much inventory I should have before talking with them. Um, I usually suggest that, you know, 10 paintings. There's no magic number, but I think that you certainly want to have more than three or four. Um, uh, art galleries always like to know that artists have a body of work that represents, you know, their style, and so they can. Um, you know, more properly gauge what sort of artist you are. And also, if they're going to have a show, you know, it's going to be more than three or four paintings. But one thing I would uh, very much do is, is don't hesitate. If you paint paintings that you feel like are not your best, 
you know, uh, sell them to your relatives at a discount or, or give them away or whatever or just put them in the attic. But I would only show the galleries your very best work and I think 10 is probably a good minimum number uh, to have uh, to show. I live in a very rural area without an art community. What are your thoughts on finding a mentor? Is there a proper way to contact artists online to seek advice or critiques? Um, I don't think there's any particular way, um, you know, other than sending an email or whatever it is. Um, but we have an artist forum where artists can ask questions, uh, discuss each other's work. Um, even, you know, there's a lot of things that I don't know in particular, like I don't do any glazing and there's things that I don't teach. But you'll find artists on there that have, uh, you know, done all these methods and any question that you post on our forum will usually get you'll get an answer within you know 12 or 24 hours and it's um, almost always correct and a very good answer so it's a great place to uh, interact with other artists online mark have you ever painted any self portraits if so would you care to show one or two would you suggest using a mirror or a photo when attempting a self portrait um, I've never painted a self-portrait, um, otherwise I would show, show you one. Um, regarding whether to work from a photograph or a mirror, I think working from a photograph is, is um, certainly easier in the sense that you have a perfect model that's going to freeze and you can focus on your work instead of trying to, you know, every time you turn to the mirror you have to essentially repose yourself, so it's a little more difficult, a little more trouble in that way. Um, but other than that, I, I, you know, I always like to work from life because getting a good photograph is difficult um, and you can always count on your colors being natural if you're working from life. So, you know, there's advantages to either one. Um, I would probably work from life if I was going to do my own just to, to make it more interesting. Um, I tend to paint with a broader stroke when I work from life. When I work from a photograph, I tend to be a little more detailed, but it's not a huge deal. Um, if you do work from a photograph, um, you know, you might want to consider flipping uh, the, the image in Photoshop so that it's a mirror image of you because that's what you're accustomed to looking at. And then it'll be more like a traditional uh, photograph or, or rather self-portrait where you're, you know, seeing a mirror image of yourself. Um, but other than that, I really don't have any advice about that. Do you have a video on how to paint from start to finish that covers the basics of painting? Um, I do. I have several videos. Um, if you go to drawmixpaint.com and uh, look at the list of videos there, there are three in particular, and we have them highlighted. And they are the first one is how to draw in proportion, the second is how to uh, mix colors, and the third one is how to paint in oil. Um, and those three videos, that's the real meat of my method, and I would definitely watch those first to, to get a sense of, you know, what it's all about. I also have a video for sale that is uh, How to Paint Realism, which is really just a very in-depth version of the How to Paint in Oil. It, it goes into the basics, but also gets into um, more in-depth uh, fabrics and painting glass surfaces, reflective surfaces. So I also have that video available. Well, that's it for today's episode. Thank you for watching. Uh, again, if you have any questions for me, leave them in the comments section of this video, and I will get to as many of those questions as I can next week. Um, we've had some questions regarding the color checker, which I was not able to get into in this episode, but we're going to be addressing uh, those questions in, in an upcoming episode. Uh, how to use a color checker when you're painting plain air, how to use a color checker when working from a computer monitor, some of those things which I think will be very helpful. So be t uh, sure to tune in um, in upcoming episodes and we'll address those questions. Thanks for watching.